Welcome to late Lecture 8 on the topic of plant genetics. This lecture is a part of the subject Future Farming Technologies, which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This degree is offered at both North Melbourne Institute of TAFE and Melbourne Polytechnic. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for information on this course and other courses that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. Lecture 8 is part of the topic genetics. In this lecture you'll be learning specifically about plant breeding. We will start with an introduction to plant breeding and associated definitions. We will then describe empirical and scientific breeding technologies. Please note, this lecture is a simple introduction to some of the commonly used technologies. It is not meant to be, nor is it, a conclusive overview of all plant breeding technologies. This lecture allows us to explore student learning objectives 4 and 5, concentrating on the basis for the genetic engineering methodologies. You will also learn some appropriate terminology in this lecture. The history of plant breeding is indeed an interesting one. Mankind has been plant breeding for some time. There is some evidence dating back 48,000 years ago for flower grinding, for example. And 23,000 years ago, people in Jordan Valley were harvesting and grinding wild cereals and baking the flour into breaks and cakes. It is estimated that the management and processing of wheat first started about 30,000 years ago. About 12,000 years ago, mankind was involved in formal cultivation of crops in several regions of the world. The first cereal grains were domesticated about 12,000 years ago by ancient farmer communities in what is known as the Fertile Crescent region. Hema wheat, Urkin wheat and barley were the three so-called Neolithic founder crops in the development of agriculture. Dennis Murphy stated that the role of selection was the backbone of breeding. When we think of breeding, the first thing that may come to mind is evolution. All creatures have evolved to abiotic, non-living part of the environment and the reason <coughs> and the response of these factors have driven selection. This sort of selection tends to be a negative one, that is, it is less fit individuals are eliminated from the population. Non-intentional selection is where <coughs> selection occurs almost by accident. It is in the past selection was based on characteristics that human could easily identify, such as larger seed size. The simplest form of traditional grain breeding or selection involves plants planting the seeds into fill tillered fields, harvesting the grain and bearing structures for the threshold out of the seeds by mechanical aggregation. Just by growing the crop in this way, a huge selection pressure is established that favours plants that do not shed the seeds before harvest is ready. Modern selection techniques are supported by sophisticated genetic and phenotyping technology. So let us look at some of the traits that we might want to include in a breeding program. An erect habitat, flowering that occurs all at the same time, seed coats that are thin, a camouflage coloration, large seed populations and larger seed size so they can be mechanically sown much easier. So there have been some positive and negatives from empirical breeding. Empirical breeding has been able to increase yields. It has been able to look at and concentrate on regional product, cro crop adaptations, so that is, a characteristic has been selected for that climate, that soil and that elevation and there is an adaption of hosts to new environments. Some of the setbacks in this kind of breeding including new diseases, warfare and local climatic events took their toll on food production. Phenotyping is a rate limiting step in such a large scale of breeding 
Therefore, one might want to develop phenotyping platforms. There is an example stated by Zaymar. Phenotyping should include seed and early seed mutation, plant size, plant height, leaf morphology, leaf colour, flowering timing, inflorescence structure and flower morphology, flower colour, fruit size, fruit morphology, fruit colour and fruit ripening. Any condition leading to partial or incomplete unfruitfulness should be selected against and you should look closely at disease and stress responses when you are setting up your phenotyping platforms. The following abstract is from Amenda et al. in 2004 in a paper called In Silco, in Silco Screening of a Saturated Maturation Library of Tomato. This was published in 2004 in the Plant Journey, Journal. Please have a read of this abstract. It gives details of the technique EMS or methyl, or ethyl methane sulfonate. This is a fast neutro neutron mutagenesis technique that can be applied to tomato plants. In silica is an express used to perform on computer via computer stimulation. Isogenic tomato plants are tomato plants that are genetically identic identical except for the sex. They come from the same individual or from the same inbred strain. Please stop the video or pause the video and take a few minutes to read the abstract. Mm. On the screen you will see an illustration of the M82 leaf, leaf muted mutations from the paper. These give you an example of in silco screening. As you can see, the shape and the area of the leaf changes considerably with the different mutations presented. This kind of screening methodology does have its advantages, but it also has a problem in that there is a large amount of information that is generated, and this information needs to be processed, and that in itself is a significant task. The development of these kinds of technologies have resulted in sophisticated methods for coupling phenotypic and genotypic information for plant genetic resource collections. Another resource by Lee et al. in 2005 is an article in Plant Phys Physiology. This is not a central reading, but you can have a look at the abstract of this, where you will learn about another generic database for and techniques for integrating both genotypic and phenotypic information for plant genetic resource collections. If you do read this, you will see how complicated and in fact in depth and, and a large degree of com computation is required in order to achieve this. The figure on the slide shows you some of the complexity. This is a graphic of the germinate schema for the database for integrating both phenotypic and genotypic information. It has been noted that there are some concerns about plant breeding. Many governments in many areas around the world are significantly reducing their breeding programs. This is a great concern for the agricultural industry. If there is a reduced amount of breeding programs, then newly emerging breeding technologies will be reduced. Also, the funding will be directed by industry and industry specific outcomes. Therefore, the novel science that has produced some, in, some interesting and unexpected advances in this field will not be accommodated and this might significantly reduce our ability to meet climate change demands in plant breeding. If you go into Google you'll be able to find the Plant Breeding Institute at Sydney University. This gives you an example of some <clears throat> plant breeding technologies such as serial double head haploids, crown rot resistant screening, serial rust, fee for service and environmental impact testing. We will not cover these techniques in any detail in this subject, but it is there for your reference in the future if you need it. The science of plant breeding, put simply, is that plant breeding is, is challenging changing of genetics in order to produce a desired characteristic. Plant breeding can be accomplished through many different techniques ranging from simple selecting plants, 
with desirable characteristics for propagation to more complex molecular techniques. There are several concepts to the science of plant breeding. Firstly, the role of variation and selection in plant breeding. A breeder needs some degree of variation between individuals in a given population and then needs to select the most suitable variants. These variants are crossed with each other to produce a population that is composed of newly selected genetic variety. There is a problem, however. In the monocultural type systems that we have bred over centuries, many crops have now a low degree of variation. This is only a problem from a breeding perspective. It is not a problem from a farming perspective. In fact, it is a highly regarded trait from a farming management perspective. Plants regularly have what we call stomatic mutations. These mutations contribute to the germ line as flowers develop at the ends of branches composed of the stomatic cells. Some plants are capable of what we call self-fertilization. This means the plant is both the mother and the father. Some plants are nearly exclusively self-fertilizers. Polyploid individuals are capable of self-fertilizing and can give rise to a genetically distinct lineage, which can be the start of a new species. The final concept I'd like to introduce to you here in these lectures is that hybrids between plant species are easy to create by hand pollination and may be more successful on average than hybrids between animal species. In the introductory lecture on genetics, we looked at the method of hand pollination and you can refer back to these lectures for more details. Tens of thousands of offspring can be created from a single cross to obtain a single individual with desirable characteristics. So let us have a look at some of these modern practices. I will point out here that there isn't enough time to go into all of the areas of plant genetics in the detail that I would like. However, we will have enough time to introduce some of these concepts to you. So one of the first trends that we are seeing in recent genetics is a return to using wild type for the variation. This is very time consuming and can be expensive, however does allow a new source of variation to enter the, genetic pop the genetics. Mutagenesis is genetic information of an organism which is changed in a stable manner resulting in a mutation. This is certainly a practice that enables new variation in the population. Transgenesis is the process of introducing an exogenous gene. And hybrids, where offspring resulting from the interbreeding between two animals or plants of different species is undertaken. Also, we see the practices of wild crosses. I'd like to differentiate between empirical breeding and scientific breeding. Empirical breeding is a form of breeding that utilises informed trial and error to affect crop improvement. Developed before the science that supports these improvements were understood, there are some exceptional good outcomes for this kind of breeding. Example of this practice, a farmer would only select seed from the best plants that had an excellent crop and thus selecting for seed number and, and yield attributes. It used to be common practice that a farmer would keep a component of his seed every year and plant a small section of the field with this seed, thus obtaining new and sustaining old variation in his crop. Now let us move on to scientific breeding. The assumptions underpinning this breeding technique are based on partial understanding of the traits that regulate the agronomic performance of the crop. Some knowledge is also required on how to manipulate these traits. There are several stages. Firstly, the trait of interest must be identified, and there are a suite of techniques which will enable scientists to do this. Once the trait has been identified, you then have to locate 
on which chromosome or number of chromosomes is the protein coding for this trait. Once you have identified on the chromosome or chromosomes where this trait is, you must then implement a technique or techniques to manipulate the chromosome. That is, you can turn expression on or you can turn expression off, depending on how you want to manipulate this trait. Once you have enabled and tested the switching on and off of the trait, you can then take this manipulation into a crop. You usually use some form of seed or cutting. <clears throat> the following slide illustrates a theoretical example which I am hoping will show you the difference between empirical breeding and scientific breeding. In empirical breeding, as we have reviewed, a cross may be conducted. This cross would result in a number of offspring. These offsprings would have a variety of traits due to the cross combination. In our theoretical example, the trait of interest is going to be fruit size. When you look at the offspring as shown on the screen, you will see that the plant with the arrow pointed towards it has some good attributes. It looks like a strong plant, it's not too tall. But its fruit is not of the desirable characteristic. If, however, we look at the other plant on the right hand side of the image, you will see that the fruit are much larger in this image. And this plant will be selected by the farmer. The approach is quite different in scientific breeding. You start not with the breeding as, a, as in empirical breeding, but you start with understanding the plant. That is, the trait that codes for the larger fruit size would be identified by a number of experiments. The identification of this trait may come from another plant, such as our model plant, Arabidopsis, and the findings might be investigated to see if they match our plant of interest. This is just one such technique, there are others. The identification of the trait or traits across the chromosomes would be, would be completed. These traits would then be manipulated by either silencing them, turning them off, or promoting them, turning them on. This would, be, this would then be tested. If the results were conclusive, the trait or manipulation could then be put into our model crop plant. Thus, in this case, you are unlikely to change any other component about the plant. That is either physically or the components that you cannot see, such as a chemical component or a defence trait. There have been a whole suite of drivers of change. What I mean by this is that there have been a number of reasons for why we have changed from the old traditional breeding techniques to more modern ones. The first one I want to touch on is that of genetic resources. Because we have been so apt at producing monocultural type crops, we have lost much of the natural genetic variation. This poses significant challenges for empirical breeding as you just don't seem to see a variation that occurs in the population. If you haven't got this initial variation, then you can't compare parents with extreme traits. Farming is complex. It is a complicated ecosystem. Therefore, you want to obtain many of the <coughs> traits that you have spent many years breeding in, such as disease resistance to some of your more potent diseases. Therefore, keeping your crop variety is very important. The use of seeds in farming and how their shape and size is very important in the efficiencies of sowing. Therefore, if you do use empirical methods, you may be changing seed dynamics. This also includes the viability and the speed of germination. All of these characteristics have been optimised for current modern te technologies and for modern farming practices. Finally, plant products and the field environment have all been optimised or 
at least are in the process of being optimised. When you undertake more modern technologies, it can be argued that you can retain all of these characteristics. Alongside this, there have been a number of gene discoveries. These are under the science of the omics. The new breeding techniques have allowed us to look at genetic resources in a new way. There are new propagation techniques that enable taking the trait of interest and scaling that up onto a, pr a large production scale so then your manipulations can be used in a commercial sense. There are of course new demands from the industry and the consumer and these are evolving all of the time. It has been argued that once you understand all of the genes and their associated traits, you may be able to respond very effective and quickly relative to the more empirical methods although I think we have a long way to go before we, were at, we are at this standard for many crop plants. And there are new demands from society about sustainability. There are arguments that the more modern technologies will enable this kind of approach. I'd like to thank Professor Patrick de Jordan for the information on this slide. Professor Patrick de Jordan listed a number of what he saw were significant challenges for plant breeding. Creating novel combinations of, of alleles. Fixing desirable combinations for market release in a timely manner. And controlling gene flow, especially for novel non-food traits. <coughs> so let us have a look in more detail about some of the modern ways to genetically modify plants. There are two predominant procedures for transforming genes in organisms. What is called the gene gun method, where, as it says, the gene of interest or the genes of interest or traits of interest are shot into the plant. And the second method, the agrobacterium method. This is a method where we rely on disease in order to insert the traits of interest. Molecular biology is the science where we determine the gene location and try to understand gene regulation and function. Please note, the genetically engineered crops, or GMO, will be covered in another suite of lectures that will follow this. We will not talk about them here. The gene gun method was developed for in vivo, that is within a living organism, transformation. It is often used in transforming, transforming monocot species such as rice or wheat. As the method indicates, it shoots genes into the plant cells and the plant cell chloroplasts. DNA is coated with small pieces of gold or tungsten, which is approximately 2 micrometers in diameter. In a vacuum chamber, the particles are <coughs> propelled at high velocity using a short pulse of high pressure helium gas. It hits a fine mesh which then coats the, which where the DNA can be transferred into the target cell or tissue. This image is a good one to learn when trying to memorize the techniques as it has the major components. You have the plant on a petri dish which is put in the chamber the chamber is under pressure. The DNA is on the gold-plated bullet. It is then shot in the vacuum onto the plant. The gene is then taken up into the plant. Plants are then regenerated within the technique of tissue culture. The plants are then removed out into the natural environment to ensure that they will be able to grow productively in our agricultural crop in our agricultural environment. I'd like you to pause the video now and go to another YouTube video. The link is on Moodle 2. Please watch the gene gun method. This gives you a practical demonstration of what it looks like in order to actually do this method. The second video that I want to would like you to watch is called Gene Works and is also found on Moodle. I want you to think about what is the role of the promoter. <coughs>
What happens if a gene is turned on permanently? There is some evidence to suggest that we can switch genes on from the host DNA, but what are the ramifications of this? Do we need to worry about this? Please make notes on these two videos and insert your lecture notes here. Now let us learn about the agrobacterium method. This is also referred to as the agrobacterium to mephacins mediated gene transfer. It is a method for transferring genetic material into the plant cell using the organism agrobacterium. Transformation via an agrobacterium has been successfully practiced in both dicots and in some monocots. Its advantage is that it has a greater frequency of single site insertions of the foreign DNA. It relies on a process that occurs naturally in nature. The image on the slide is a visual representation of the concepts of the agrobacterium method. You can see a TI plasmid with the DNA section or transfer DNA of interest. You can also see the agrobacterium chromosome. The agrobacterium then inserts itself into the plant cell. It is here that the agrobacterium DNA will multiply in the plant cell with the transfer DNA. This will cause what looks like a cancerous type um, growth. It is at this point that the inserted DNA will make many copies and that copy will be translocated or moved throughout the plant depending on the type of coffee, copy and the method. For more information on this technique, I have found an open source article that summarises this plant methodology. Please read this at your convenience. Once you have read it, make notes and insert those notes into your lecture here. The agrobacterium belongs to the group of bacteria gram-negative. It can infect plants naturally and it causes the following symptoms. This is known as crown gall disease. The tumour inducing function of the agrobacterium is the function that allows the genetic transfer of material. So let us review the process of the agrobacterium method to ensure we are familiar with the stages. The genes to be introduced in the plant are cloned or copied into the plant transformation vector. That contains the tDNA region of the disarmed plasma. Together with a susceptible marker, such as an anti antibiotic resistance, it enables the selection of plants that have been successfully transformed. Plants are grown on a media containing antibiotic following transformation, and those that do not have the tDNA integrated into the genome will die. <coughs> an alternative method to this is agrofiltration. This is where the plant is transformed using agrobacterium transformed cells that start forming calluses on the side of leaf pieces. Transformation with agrobacterium can be achieved in a number of ways. Protoplasts or leaf discs can be introduced into the agrobacterium and whole plants regenerated using the technique of plant tissue culture. A common transformation protocol for Arabidopsis is called the floral dip method. The flowers are dipped into the agrobacterium culture and the bacterium transforms the gene lines that make up the female gametes. The seeds can be screened for antibiotic resistance and thus you know have the marker of interest. And plants that have not integrated the plasma DNA will die. Please read chapter 5 on the topic of genetic engineering, which can be found in the Science of Agriculture, A Biological Approach, which is edited by Ray Heron. I would like you to read this, make notes, and insert your notes in your lecture here. This resource can be found at the NMIT Epping Library. It is a requirement that you read this article in order to complete your understanding of this topic. I would like you to source the following article, The Use of Genetic Resources and Biodiversity in Classical Plant Breeding. This can be found on Moodle.
please download a copy of this paper and make some notes and insert your notes here. I'm going to give you a selection of questions in one of the associated tutorials with this lecture. Please read the article and have a go at answering the questions and bring this along to the tutorial. If you are doing the flexible delivery component of this subject, then please email me your completed tutorial questions. Using both this lecture notes you will have, and the resources accompanying this lecture, you will now have, I hope, an overall understanding of plant breeding and genetics. You will be able to describe the differences between empirical breeding and scientific plant breeding methodologies. You will understand specific technologies such as the gun and agrobacterium ways of placing information into plants to change their genetics. And finally, you should understand some of the issues associated with the plant breeding, both traditional and scientific. Understand about genetic resources and biodiversity. This brings us to the end of this lecture.